What's up, Cybonics, and welcome to an honest review of the Ionic Visual Studio Code extension. If you didn't know this, Ionic released a Visual Studio Code extension because Visual Studio Code is pretty much the standard editor for a lot of web developers these days. And the Ionic extension comes with a bunch of things that you usually do with the CLI and even additional things that you can now directly do from Visual Studio Code. I also saw the announcement video on the Ionic channel about this extension and that got a lot of troll comments, that got a lot of flutter fanboys, it had editor fanboys, and it had some legit uh, critique to the plugin in general. But I wanted to give you my perspective on this plugin because I think it's important to understand for which type of developers this plugin is and what it actually does and where it probably could be approved. So I will give you my honest view about this and we're gonna take a live look at it right now. All right, let's explore the extension together. First of all, you're gonna hit to extensions in Visual Studio Code and you can search for Ionic. Then you should find the one with the blue check mark, install it and probably you need to reload Visual Studio Code, but don't think so actually. Then you should actually have a new icon here, <laughs> Ionic, uh, which I currently don't see um, simply because I got too many icons. Oh, no, I got it, nice. And if I start the Visual Studio Code in a blank folder, I can actually use this to generate a new project, which is pretty cool. So let's do this for the tabs. I'm just gonna call this my app, whatever. It doesn't really matter too much. Um, but this already brings me to one of the first issues. Or should we wait for it? Probably we should wait. Now, when the NPM packages are installed, uh, it will change the view, and this is the view you should see also when you open any existing Ionic project. So this is pretty much the overview of the Ionic Visual Studio Code extension. We can uh, basically ignore this, this is only for support, and then we got a few other options here that we wanna check out. Now, first of all, after generating this project, uh, we can of course run it on the web, which is quite interesting. Um, you can actually configure this to either open uh, Visual Studio Code uh, or open the preview inside of Visual Studio Code. I don't know which option is enabled by default, or you can just run it in your browser. Um, of course, the surf command should be pretty familiar to every Ionic developer, but still, if you're a new developer, it's, well, not, not too bad to have it in there. So in my case, it did open uh, Chrome, uh, there it is. But actually, you can somehow configure this to run inside of Visual Studio Code. I don't know why, in my case, it always resets this, um, but you could check it out under settings. So uh, view in editor should be activated in that case. Um, you can also just go to the advanced tab and then you would see uh, the specific settings, but now it should have live reload, yeah. I don't know why, now we got a uh, check mark here, view in editor, but not preview in editor. There's some kind of disconnect between the settings of the plugin and this, I'm not sure how it's possible because usually it just uses one JSON file in the background for the Visual Studio Code settings, but uh, now we can actually see the preview. Can I make this a bit smaller? Yeah, probably. So this can actually be helpful to have everything in one project. Um, yeah, now I lost this, so let's bring the preview over here and close this. So this could kind of be uh, something you might be interested in. So let's change something. Where can we change it? Here, tab one, test. Like if I update this, it will update the view. It now of course looks kind of horrible because I'm always zoomed in. I'm at zoom four for recording videos so you can see this correctly. If I would zoom out, it would actually look okay and you could just do it side by side. Well, I don't know, I would now at zoom four again. Uh, I don't know if you really need this, but if you want an integrated solution, well, it's a nice uh, way of having your preview right in here. Now, let's skip debug. We're gonna talk about this in the end. We will also now stop this. And I wanna go to Capacitor because with Capacitor, I should be able to run the app on my device or a simulator. Right now, I don't have any Capacitor platform edits, so I'm gonna head over to the Recommendations tab, which instead tells me uh, add an Android project and add an iOS project. So let's just run this. It will ask again with a little toast message if I wanna do this. Um, we're gonna have to talk about these messages and pop-ups uh, later again. Let's do the same for iOS, add iOS. 
and it will add the iOS project, which should bring us to the first issue of this, uh, which is not really an issue of the, the, the plugin itself, but a Visual Studio code. So it didn't find my Cocoa Pods installation um, for whatever reason. And the fix to this came from a Flutter <laughs> Stack Overflow answer. Uh, the answer is pretty much uh, close to this. Um, open the folder, open Visual Studio Code from the command line. And if I open Visual Studio Code from the command line, I'll be able to add iOS because the path settings are now correct. Uh, as we can see, it immediately runs the installation for Capacitor iOS. So this is not a problem of the extension itself. It's just a problem of Visual Studio Code not picking up my Cocoa Pods path. Also, it tells me to add the Ionic CLI. I have the Ionic CLI globally installed, so probably the plugin could check for the global installation of the Ionic CLI instead. Um, now I'm also installing it uh, locally as a development dependency, yeah, as a development dependency in the project. Well, okay, whatever. Um, what else? Protractor, your project has dependency on Protractor? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't care right now. <laughs> Um, so now we could actually directly open our project in Xcode and Android Studio. I kind of like that part. Um, I don't know why. Sometimes I'm just lazy and just want to click something. So just clicking on this instead of typing cap open iOS, cap open Android, it actually, it actually feels okay. Um, we can now also run the usual capacitor commands from here, like running the sync or the build. Um, if you're a new developer, probably you don't really know what this means. So maybe the, the terminology here could be changed because I feel like the extension is kind of made for um, new developers, people not familiar with the CLI yet. Um, so they really or maybe don't know exactly what uh, sync in here means. Now, let's see what we can do as well. Where's my Xcode? Uh, there it is. So what I wanna show you is that we can actually change quite easily the settings of our project. Uh, so let's do this side by side. Um, and we can go to the configuration and then for example, change our bundle ID. So let's change this to comdevdactic.coolapp. I'm gonna hit enter. And in the background, we already see Xcode updates and we have the new bundle identifier. And we can do the same for the display name and call this one um, Simon's app. We could change the version number to be, um, we can change the version number to be 1.1. And all the time our project would just update those settings in here. This is something I really like. Um, because it's not always clear how this works, how you can change your version number, the build number, uh, especially if you're new developers. Um, but also for me, I sometimes forget in which file I need to dive into. So it's whatever, some Gradle file in the Android project. Is it the build Gradle? No, it's the variables. Mm, no, it's the Gradle, pro no, it's the settings. <laughs> Okay, here finally is it. I don't know if I skipped that file or didn't run a sync command before, but here are the changes for Android as well, the application ID, the version code, the version name, and most likely this change is also reflected in the, mm, not manifest, but in the, oh, uh, where is it? Where is our main, yeah, probably at manifest. <laughs> So it hopefully yeah, changed our name up here as well. Oh, I don't wanna change this. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm really bad with uh, Android Studio. But it changed our name in here as well. What's interesting about this is for uh, seasoned developers, we kinda know that usually this change is also reflected in the uh, capacitor config.json file, which is actually not the case uh, with the settings here. So they're not persisted in here. They're most likely just using the tool from Max that we inspected in the past, uh, which in the uh, background can, through the CLI, update your native project, which is in itself a pretty cool project that you should definitely check out. I think um, these prompts are a bit like, yeah, that could have been done better. Like you click on this and it opens or <laughs> doesn't open a, a view up here. I think just having a page with a configuration would work better. And I think this was actually a thing in the past. Like there was a 
extension before? I don't know. Um, still, it's cool that we can do it. Okay, let's look at the next tab. That's a splash screen. Uh, we can easily add a splash screen. Once again, we get this cool uh, toast notification. So I can now pick a file. Uh, for the splash, I'm just using an existing file from my application. And then I'm also going to setting an icon. So for whatever reason, it's just only reacting on the second click. So let me bring in the icon and then the warning here should hopefully disappear because it's using the Cordova res command in the background, I assume, to um, generate the icon files. Also, uh, when this is finished, we should be able to see those files. Uh, let's check it out in my view right here. Uh, so yeah, they're pretty much added as uh, resources, splash and icon right here, uh, what you would expect as well. And they should also hopefully turn up in our native project, like the launch screen. Yeah, there we go. And somewhere we would also find our app icon. Yeah, there it is as well. So this is pretty quite cool um, because this is also usually a problem for uh, new developers where to create those things. Then we can also manage packages um, and add some. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> I think we all know how to npm install something. For capacitor plugins, I think there's uh, an opportunity because you can add something and need to enter the package name. Now, I don't really know the package name probably just because I also don't always know them. But let's say I want to add the capacitor camera now. Um, this actually works pretty nice. So at that point, I think we could have like a list of available plugins to select from, probably also jumping into the documentation. Um, and then we see the camera appears in here. So definitely think there's an opportunity. Uh, okay, this info actually brings us to the info page. That's cool. That's a good start. Uh, but feel like we can do even more like showing uh, community plugins, core plugins, and just clicking on them. Um, and just, yeah, making life easier for developers because that's what this extension I think is about or should be about. Okay, we've seen the settings, we've seen the plugins, packages, the recommendations, splash screen, configuration, scripts. Well, that's just the script of your package JSON file. Let's finally also take a look at debugging because I think this is one of the most interesting things. So let's run the debugger on the web. I would actually really love to have the debug view in Visual Studio Code, uh, which for some reason doesn't seem to work. Um, probably because, I don't know, because Visual Studio can't connect to itself or anything like that. Uh, anyway, uh, let's add our view in here. I'm going to make Visual Studio a bit smaller. And then we're inside the debugging view and we can now just hit over to our code and let's say I want to uh, do something with the explore container. And when this one is called, I'm going to hit a breakpoint. So let's move to tab two in the debugger strikes. We're here in the explore container. Uh, we can explore this. We can explore the name because on tab two, the name tab two page is passed to it. Uh, we see the call stack and of course, I don't want to change this. Um, we could now debug our functions. We could step through them um, and do everything you're used to. This is not unique to the Ionic Visual Studio Code extension. You can also um, just run your application in Chrome and then from Visual Studio Code connect to that debugging, uh, connect the debugging tools to it. Um, so it's not rocket science, but I feel like this is making debugging with Visual Studio Code a lot easier for Ionic. Um, I haven't used this extensively in the past because I always wasn't sure like I need to supply some URL to the running instance and connect this one time. But just having this with one click um, connected, I feel like this is making my life a bit easier and I definitely like this. So overall, um, a lot of interesting options here and still a bit of room to grow in the future. All right, 
And that's it for today's Tish review. You can now call me MKBH Simon, and I hope this gave you an impression of the plugin about the good things and the probably not so good things. First of all, Ionic is not responsible for my own CLI path problem with Visual Studio Code. That's definitely not onto the plugin. But second, what I think the input fields, like changing the bundle ID, the build number with these small fields, that's just too small. It should be like a page where we can just configure our stuff and also that stuff should be reflected in the capacitor config file in my eyes just to just yeah just to see the changes not only in the native project but also persisted in that file. Additionally we also saw when I wanted to add an icon or splash screen it showed this little toast message down there and I had to click it and it opened something. I think this could be a bit more visual and as well for the plugins I see a huge opportunity because just having an input field where I can type something, I really need to know the plugin in that case. So if there was a list of available plugins, of community plugins, and I could just click on them and install them, I think this was possible with Ionic Studio in the past. So remember the cool project that never really... <laughs> it was an interesting project, definitely, but yeah, no. Nah. I think it's good they discontinued Ionic Studio. But yeah, having the ability to easily add capacitor plugins to the project would be a great addition, as well as having the configuration of the settings a bit more visual in that plugin. However, I do like the recommendations, which could print a lot of interesting things, even for seasoned developers and existing projects. And I definitely like the debugging, which works very, very fast. And I'm gonna use this a lot more in the future. Which brings me to my final conclusion, drumroll please. Okay, I think this Visual Studio Code extension is certainly great for new developers. You see a list of the templates you can generate, you can easily run it, uh, you can open the native platforms, you can sync it, you can add the icons, and you can do all of this just with a click of your mouse. And I think as a beginner, it's not that easy to understand the CLI immediately. You need to learn a bunch of things about Ionic in general, so that is definitely a great use case for beginners and for people who are more familiar with, in general, UI tools and don't really like command line interfaces. However, for seasoned developers, like I would call myself after five, six, eight years with Ionic, I kind of know every command from the CLI. So I know what I need to put into the CLI to have live reload on my device, to deploy something to anything, to sync, to copy. And that just feels to me a bit more Well, it just feels for me like I can do it and I understand and I know what I'm doing because the extension does certain things on click and you maybe don't know what exactly the command that it runs means. Yes, you can see the output in Visual Studio Code, but probably you don't want to look at the output all the time because you want to select the, the stuff from there and not look at a CLI. But there's one catch and I think having the search for plugins, having cool recommendations, having the settings in an easier way would be a great addition even for seasoned developers and experienced Ionic developers. So I think there is potential to not only cater the beginner market, but also bring in other developers, the experienced developers, and get them on board with this extension if you can do a lot of cool things for your project in an easy visual way. So definitely room to grow and I hope Ionic is watching this video and probably want to see a few cool changes about this in the future. On top of that, I also definitely recommend you check out another uh, extension for Ionic, which I usually use for snippets. This is also a pretty great addition for Ionic users. It comes with a bunch of snippets and I really use them regularly just to have a lot of boilerplate in my uh, project. And I really use this quite often when I want to have like a dummy list of cards when I have an alert controller syntax, all of these things, it's really, really easy to use it with that extension as well. All right, thanks for sticking with me and thanks for checking this out. Give it a try, install it and see for yourself if it's helpful or not. And I'm gonna catch you in the next video. So until then, as always, happy coding, Simon.